Hi everyone, it's Nina Collins, and I'm here today with an author, Melody Wilding, um, to talk about her new book that's just out called Trust Yourself. Um, and the subtitle, oh good, Melody's gonna hold it back, <laughs> perfect. Trust, no, wait, I can't read that, I have to read that. I'll like, read it. You read if it. you want. Perfect. Yes, so it is called Trust Yourself, Stop Overthinking, and Channel Your Emotions for Success at Work. Perfect, okay. And Melody is an executive coach for smart, sensitive, high achievers, and she, you're a licensed social worker. Yes. Um, and this is your first book, right? Yes, that's right. Yes. So tell us a little bit about, and it was named best book of the month by at Apple, which I didn't quite know what that was, but that's still a big thing to be best book of the month. It's awesome. It just came out this month in May. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's about how to control your emotions while at work. So tell mm -hmm. us about you and why you decided to write this book. <laughs> Yeah, this book is really the combination of my professional experiences and my personal experiences come together. So uh, on the professional side, as you mentioned, I have a background as a licensed social worker. So before I began coaching, I was doing therapy. I have a background in neuroscience. I teach human behavior at the graduate level. So all of my work is very heavily informed by that psychology perspective. Oh, so, and so young. How old are you? <laughs> I am 33. Sometimes I forget. Uh, but yes. So uh, when I started coaching, I really saw a gap that there wasn't really anyone talking about how our psychology, our thoughts and our emotions really influence our success. Uh, and then on the personal side, I am the personality type I describe in the book. I am a sensitive striver, someone my whole life has been told I take things too personally. And so it is definitely influenced by my own experiences. Okay, so let's back up and talk about what a sensitive striver is. Like you coined this term. This is something. That yes. You, okay. And how do you define it? So a sensitive striver is someone who is both high achieving, meaning they are career oriented, put a lot of pressure on themselves to succeed, but also highly sensitive. So they think and feel everything more deeply than most people. And does that mean you tend to be an introvert or a sensitive striver does? Like, is it hard to be around people too much? It's a great question. About 70% of people who are sensitive are also introverted, but about 30% are not, which means there are sensitive uh, extroverts who gain energy by being around people. Mm -hmm. And how do you really define someone as sensitive? I mean, wouldn't you say we're all sensitive under certain circumstances? Of course, it's just it's just like any personality trait. It exists on a spectrum, but people with this trait of high sensitivity, and I should say that is not something I coined. That has been something that has been well researched for about right. thirty years or so. But if we look at brain scans of people who have this, who are highly sensitive, they have different brain activation in areas related to uh, empathy, uh, attention, decision making. Uh, so it's a very uh, distinct trait that actually means you have a more highly attuned central nervous system. Interesting. Like children who are, I remember when I had, my, I have four kids and when they were smaller, oh. it was like that moment, my kids are in their twenties. So they kind of grew up in the era when everything was suddenly being diagnosed. And there were kids with sensitivity issues, you know, around like clothing. I can't remember exactly what it's called. Like where tags yeah. bother you and certain mm -hmm. fabrics bother you. And one of my children was a little bit like that, not quite diagnosable, but definitely a thing. Um, right. So how do you identify someone who's this sensitive or just by talking to them, I guess? Yeah. In the book, you know, it's a, it's a, a bit of an imperfect process, but in the book, I do have a quiz and a diagnostic. Uh, there are six key characteristics that I can run through very quickly. Uh, the first is sensory sensitivity. So having that exaggerated nervous system response, as you were saying, being very reactive to things that are happening around you or, uh, clothing for an example, but in the professional world, this can look like being very easily overwhelmed if you're put under pressure or if you're evaluated or watched. Um, so sensitive strivers tend to have a lot of trouble with open office or even having to present in meetings because we feel as we're being judged. So yeah, yeah, we have sensitivity, we have thoughtfulness. Uh, deep thinkers, very reflective, intuitive, but also struggle with overthinking, indecision, and doubt. Mm -hmm. Responsibility, highly responsible, dependable, can be counted on to follow through, sometimes too much, that we are the ones that will work all weekend or pull 16-hour days because we want to keep other people happy and be the team player. Yeah. 
Then we have inner drive. That is very much the striver side, the ambition of wanting to always do more, achieve more, make an impact, but we can take on too many goals and sometimes set too high of a bar for success that it's impossible to reach. Mm -hmm. Vigilance. Yeah. More vigilance or maybe two more. Two more, two more. Vigilance is being attentive to other people's needs, being, uh, sensing subtleties, but sometimes you can read in too much to people's behavior or throw away comment, for example. Mm -hmm. And then last is emotionality. We have big feelings, complex feelings, but sometimes our negative emotions, you know, fear, anxiety can stick around longer than most people. And so I'm curious how you it's funny because my oldest daughter is studying to become a therapist and I think she nice. may fall into this category. Um, I'm wondering how you discovered this about yourself. Like what was your own journey to turn a practice? Like you became a therapist and a coach and then decided yeah. specifically to work with people in the workplace. Why? Yeah. You know, I think I, I think I, I fell into it and <laughs> not, not intending to do, to do it. So, you know, my own experiences all my life, I have been told you're so sensitive. I have I've always been remarked upon for being more affected by everything that happened around me. Very empathetic uh, child, very emotional child. Um, then flash forward, also very high achieving, you know, good girl, A plus gold star that followed me into my adulthood until the, the story I recount at the beginning of the book is I hit a very severe burnout. That was really my rock bottom moment that highlighted how much I had let both my ambition take from me and really go amok and yeah. how much my sensitivity had gone completely unmanaged. Um, and so that was really my personal journey, but I think through who I was, I, uh, unbeknownst to me and, and unintentionally attracted those people into my coaching practice. Exactly. And so, yeah, as I began, as I began coaching, I kept seeing this very, a uh, repetitive constellation of challenges that I talk about in the book. And so it was just very a natural, a natural process yeah. that then I, I stepped back and said, oh, wait, the people I'm working with are on very much the same journey I was. So interesting. I like the idea of ma managing one's sensitivity. Um, so let's talk a little bit about like, you know, people, these are people who are thinking all the time, kind of, I'm not good enough, or I'm taking things too personally, right? Too much pressure. So how do you teach them? What are some of the tools? Because all women experience this, right? The kind of imposter syndrome. I mean, all people experience it to some extent. Yeah. You're talking about people who experience it to kind of a greater degree. Like, I don't consider myself a sensitive striver. Like, I'm... I think reasonably sensitive and reasonably ambitious, but I wouldn't say I'm overly either. <laughs> uh, that's, that's great because some people who are sensitive strivers say, isn't everybody like this? And they're not. So I, I actually love that you can say, no, I'm not this personality yeah. type. And I also think getting older enables you, like that's why I asked how old you were. Cause I think when I was in my twenties and thirties, I did take everything much more personally mm -hmm. and I did put much more pressure on myself. So there is yeah. a quality once you get a little older, I'm 51 now and I kind of feel like, I've said recently, like, I don't feel like I have as much to prove. So I don't feel as, and I don't feel as sensitive. Like I've, I think my boundaries have gotten better. I'm curious yes. how you think about boundaries in general. Um, yes. Cause like, I feel now like if people are mad at me or I'm nervous, I didn't get something or I didn't do something right. I'm a little better able to be like, Okay. Like to put it in perspective, you know, it's not yeah. you're in cancer here and it'll be okay. And tomorrow I'll feel better and no one's perfect. And all these things kind of really do come much more naturally to me than they did when I was younger. Um, mm -hmm. So I wonder about that also, do you have patients who are mostly your age or are they all over the map? You know, most, most of my clients are older than me. Most of my clients are in their late forties, uh, into their, sorry, I should say forties into their fifties. Um, and so, yeah, I tend to work with people who are mid career to executive level. So in that age group as well. Um, but you were asking about boundaries and boundaries. Yeah. I mean, there's an entire chapter on the book about building boundaries, and because boundaries are such an important area, because sensitive strivers, again, we tend to overwork ourselves. We tend to be people pleasers. Uh, we tend to think of boundaries as rude or mean, right? So in the book, 
I hope to reframe that. And one very uh, telling sign, one tool that I would give people is to look for the emotion of resentment. Yes. Resentment is a very powerful emotional signal that you have let something go on for too long or you feel walked over or taken advantage oh, of. Uh, someone and I, you need to set a limit. Yeah. Someone I interviewed last year, she was not a therapist, but she was writing a book about community, mm. said that her therapist had taught her that resentment is a sign that your boundaries have been crossed. And I thought that was so helpful. Like, what a way to look at it. It's completely mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you instruct your people to look at when they're feeling resentful and then do what? Well, and then you have to figure out what's the boundary that needs to be set. Most of the time, uh, sensitive strivers, we're not even, we're not confident enough in that uh, I deserve to respect my own time. So we have to actually think about what is the limit that needs to be set? What needs to be communicated to that person? And how do I do so assertively without apology or shame, or I'm sorry, I just, I can't make it. And I feel really bad. And, da -da. and we over explain, That's right. True. Cause we feel shameful about doing it okay. rather than saying, I'm not able to make it. Thank right. you so much for thinking of me. Please keep me in mind for the future, right? Yeah. Coming from a place of real um, just conviction. And like you you said, almost that settled confidence about it that I don't have anything to prove to anyone. Yeah, like a strength and a, and a clarity. Like this is what mm -hmm. I can do and this is what I can't do. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's super, super helpful. So what are some other tips for like controlling your emotions at work? I mean, people... I mean, I certainly see with people I work with, there are some, you know, people who just take things, they get very emotionally involved. Like I feel pretty, you know, I run a community of women and I really love the women. Um, but I do find I have a real ability to not get over emotionally involved. It's not that I don't really care about people. I do, but like when people are flipping out or getting super upset or mm -hmm. getting angry at me, again, I'm, I feel like I'm pretty able to kind of say like, okay, let's... <laughs> You know, let's yeah. take a look at this. Um, but I, I have women I work with who have amazing strengths, you know, who are who help run the group and they'll sometimes get more emotionally in, invested in things or upset by things. And mm -hmm. so it's different, different personalities. And I don't think I'm a cold person at all, but um, it's interesting to think about. So what are some other tips for helping people? Yeah, most of the time, what I find to be one of the stickiest areas that leads us to being emotional is self-criticism. We are so hard on ourselves that we make ourselves more emotional and upset about something because you're such an idiot. Why did you do that? Why didn't you think of that sooner? We're so cruel to ourselves that that leads to heightened emotionality. So one of my favorite tools from the book is really naming that negative self-talk, giving that inner critic a name or the voice of imposter syndrome, whatever you want to call it, giving it a name, giving it some sort of a identity, calling it a character so that you can create psychological distance from it. Yeah. And you can start to change your relationship with it. Yeah. yeah. You can see when you're doing it. I mean, these kind of things are great advice in general in life, right? These are great skills. Cause what you're talking about now, I really see with my daughters. Again, I see it a little bit as a youth thing, um, but I'm sure you're right. I'm sure for a lot of people, it continues forever. And I'm sure I did it myself when I was younger. I just don't think of it as much, but like I see my daughters who are just entering the workforce, um, feel insecure or overwhelmed or, and I'm sure there's a lot of negative self-talk and being able to identify it and saying, oh, you're doing that again. Now you, you have to stop is key, crucial because yeah. it's crazy. I mean, I always try and tell them like everyone screws up, everyone mm -hmm. you know, makes mistakes, but mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to let that go. And have yeah. you helped yourself? How are you doing at work with all this stuff now as a sensitive striver? As a sensitive striver, I, you know, I can say I am at a point in my career where who I am and what I do feels very synchronous. I feel like I have so much more inner peace than I, than I ever have before. And so my journey is, is definitely 
the one that I want to take readers on in the book, which is actually moving from a place where those strive qualities that I, that I mentioned earlier, those six qualities feel very unbalanced, which is when we have these downsides to being very balanced, that you can use them as strengths. You can be observant, perceptive at work. You can be empathetic and really use that to show up more effectively. And I feel like, you know, I'm in a very good position to do that as a coach and a writer. Um, but I do feel like even in, in my own life, I just have so much more um, inner peace and almost serenity, just comfort and confidence with who I am. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. I often think that like, our worst qualities are often also our best qualities. Like yes, I can be exactly. super decisive, but I can also be a little impetuous. Yes. So like if you are too empathic, how do you figure out how to make that a plus? How do you kind of manage it with boundaries and then yep. see it as an asset? Cause it is an asset. Empathy is yeah. an asset. Yes, you're, you're exactly right. And that's the main tool that weaves throughout the book is something I call the wheel of balance, which is a very visual way of mapping those strive qualities, those six qualities, and seeing where are you most in balance versus out of balance. And I actually have an assessment that will help you grade yourself and get a quantitative number so you can rate yourself. And then you track yourself throughout the book to see how you're doing at the beginning, the midpoint, and the end. So you can see how your scores shift as you learn the different tools in the book. But it's exactly like you were saying, developing better boundaries. Um, in the chapter on regulating your emotions, I go through the, the fact that managing your emotions comes down to managing your physiology, managing the physical reaction you have yeah. in response to your emotions. So sure. it's all of those sorts of things. Sweating, you're kind yes. of, yeah, you're getting all kind of heightened. <clears throat> I have one of my daughters, I'm constantly saying, just breathe. Just yes. <laughs> breath. Remind me again, the six things. I want to write this down. Yes. So sensitivity, mm -hmm. thoughtfulness, mm -hmm. responsibility, inner drive, vigilance, and emotionality. So it spells the acronym STRIVE very conveniently. <laughs> nice. But you know, it's funny thinking about those, like I have all of those too. Um, yeah. You know, I have a great sense of responsibility and your drive and vigilance and emotionality. I guess it's a matter of how much you're keeping it in check um, and how much you're letting it kind of take over your life and yeah. make you feel bad about yourself, right? Exactly. So a real question of balance. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And do you, when you came up with this term, the sensitive striver, are you thinking about it in terms of like, when I first read that before we met, I thought, oh, is there another, like, as opposed to what? Like, do you have a, <laughs> um, a kind of idea of like, you know, everyone in the world falls into different categories and sensitive striver is one of them? Or is this just a particular niche that you found? Yeah, you know, it's a it's a niche within highly sensitive people, uh, which, like I said, being a highly sensitive person has been well studied for decades now. But in my work, there was this other layer of ambition and achievement that came into it that further complicated being a highly sensitive person. And so it's a it's a sub niche of of that. Good for you. It sounds really like a very, very useful um, framework for people. As, as we talk, I'm really thinking about a lot of people in my life who could probably benefit from thinking about this. Yeah. You know, one in five people is sensitive. So this is either someone, you know, or you love, like you were saying, or it is you. So it's yeah. very helpful to, to know this, to know this is a very real thing and is not someone being weak or inadequate. It's a very real biological disposition. Yeah. Yeah. No, really helpful. And do you consider, are the bookstores considering your book psychology or business? Business. Okay. And how do you yeah. feel about that as a therapist? I'm happy with it. I'm happy with it because I think now more than ever, we need to be having these conversations in business, in our workplaces, in leadership. There's enough, there's enough of this conversation in the traditional self-help world, but I think we need to bring it much more into our workplaces now because we- yeah, we need these qualities of sensitive strivers more than ever before. Nice. And um, why did you become, decide to become a coach as opposed to a straight therapist? Yeah, you know, I, I was one of those weird kids that for most of my life, I knew I wanted to be a therapist. I wanted to study psychology just because I've always been so interested in people. Um, but when I... 
uh, graduated with my master's in social work, um, it was right after the recession. And so I followed the advice of very well-meaning people who said, don't be a therapist. You're not going to make good money doing that. Why don't you go into something that's more lucrative and stable like healthcare or technology? And so that's what I did. And then on the side, I was starting my coaching and therapeutic work. And through my therapeutic work, very quickly discovered that not only just my style, I'm very solution oriented. I'm from New York, New Jersey. So I like things <laughs> fast, fast, fast and give me the results. Um, so not only just my personality, but my clients, I was coaching people who were very uh, high level uh, executives, was working with the very first online therapy company back in the day. Which so uh, it was called Pretty Padded Room at the time. <laughs> um, and a good themes emerge. It's kind of fascinating with telehealth shrink. Yes. But the, the people who were comfortable using it at the time were many uh, tech founders, uh, startup executives, because they were, they were the early adopters. Mm -hmm. And so that was my clientele. And they didn't want therapy in the traditional sense. They really wanted something that was much more solution-focused, coaching-based. And, yeah. and being a social worker, actually, that's, that's pretty much what your, your training is in, because that is kind of the model now. Yeah. So it all work together all kind of came together did you get your yeah. coaching certificate at ipac by any chance in new jersey i did not i actually so i just have my master's in social work okay and then you converted it yes. into a coaching program a yes. coaching practice that's so great yeah well yeah. is there anything we've covered that you want listeners to take away from about your book that we've not that we've missed yeah, you know, I think the biggest thing is that, you know, when leveraged correctly, that your sensitivity and your ambition can be the biggest assets the biggest in your career. Asset. Yeah. You just have to get out of your own way many times. That is and a huge message. Get out of your own way and understand that your what you consider your flaws can actually be your biggest assets. It's I often think so much of life is just how we frame things, right? It's all about perspective and kind of being able to look at it differently and um because we can get so down on the, you know, individual characteristics. And in fact, you can look at them differently often and see them yeah. as assets. That's great. Yeah. That's really great. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking to us. Let's hold up your book one more time. Let's see Hello, it. This is Melody Wilding. Trust, Trust yourself. yourself. Stop overthinking and channel your emotions for success at work. It's great. Really useful book, a business book about oversensitivity, quote, oversensitivity at work and how you can make it work for you. Yes. Thank you so much, Melody. Thank you for having me. All right. Take care. Talk to you.